Coming up next, Book and It Reads, The Old Man and the Sea. Hey everybody, and welcome back to Bookin' It. I am your humble and eloquent host, Cooper Cobbs, and joining me today to talk about this very fine book are three of my friends, Matthew Killingsworth, Howdy, Tanner Lewis, Hello, and the great and glorious Isaiah Redsky. How you doing, guys? Hello. <laughs> we are doing fantastic, Cooper. Yeah, I'm doing great. You call me glorious, you know. <laughs> Best holiday <laughs> of the year, St. Patrick's Day, recording today. So yes, excited. that's right. You know, right. I mean, it's, Wait, it's just a great holiday. holiday. You know, you, you're just looking forward to it all year. Right. I buy a lottery ticket. And I then you up all year. <laughs> and then you get to it, <laughs> and you're just like, let's just have a normal day. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but hey, shout out to Nana, our donor. She yeah. made me and my sister some awesome shirts that oh, say "Not nice. Lucky, Just Blessed." What? Oh, yeah. oh nice. Yeah, they're pretty <laughs> sweet shirts. Woo! Been wearing mine today. Yep. Anyway, St. Patrick's Day aside. Oh, real quick. I gotta talk about a movie that I just saw. Real fast. <laughs> so I went in theaters and I saw the new Disney animated movie, Raya and the Last Dragon. You know? Oh, okay, yeah. Have you guys seen that yet? No. Because yeah, it's, no, it's, I won't spoil it. It's premiere spoil access it. on Disney Plus, so I'm not paying right. for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But anyway, we went and saw it in theaters, me and my family did, and essentially. It was almost great. Like, it was really good, but it wasn't quite really? great. Really? Yes. So, the message was kind of like, hey, we need to stick together in hard times. Okay. And you can tell it was, like, heavily influenced by 2020, <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. But, well, isn't yeah, everything? Then, exactly. But the dialogue wasn't that great, and there were some, like, wrinkles, and just, yeah. if it, 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 it could have been more polished. That's my only complaint. It could have okay. been more polished. But besides that, I thought it was really good. So it, it anyway. kind of looked like Moana, like it, on the it, preview. It looked like Moana, just like in Mulan. It's yeah, it's mm-hmm. like yeah, Mulan and Moana <laughs> kind of crash, but most of the aesthetics are like Moana. But yeah, I'm sure it's super interesting. <laughs> I mean, it's... <laughs> <laughs> the hesitation. No, yes, it didn't yes. look very. I I'm, I didn't want to watch it at all after seeing the preview thing. Yeah. But anyway. Aside from that, let's talk about something that actually is great, The Old Man in the Sea. Right? Cooper, Cooper's been talking this book up for a long time, and I have to say, it did not disappoint. It did that not was disappoint. Good. Before we get into actually discussing it, let's give our baggage. Um, I'm pretty sure we're not going to have a lot, so also give your baggage on your uh, baggage on the ocean and or fishing. Hmm, okay. Hmm. You go ahead start, Matthew. Oh, yeah. Sorry, my bad. So, baggage on this book. Uh, like I said, Cooper's been talking about it for a while. So, sometime last semester, Cooper was talking about the book list for this semester, and he mentioned this book. And I was like, aren't we reading that for school? And he was like, yeah, but it's so good. We're doing it anyways, and blah, 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 stuff like that. And then I actually just read it. I uh, just finished it, like, today, uh, earlier this morning. Um, so, yeah, it was good. And then baggage with ocean slash fishing. Fun fact, I've never actually been fishing in the ocean, but I've done both things separately a lot of times each. Uh, I've been to the ocean, I've been to like east coast, west coast, gulf coast, Hawaii. I've been to a lot of oceans and beaches, and I love them all. They're very fun. Um, And then fishing, I've been fishing pretty much just in lakes or ponds uh, for, I, I I don't remember the first time I went fishing. It was years ago, probably at the lake. Yeah, yeah. Me, awesome. me and my, me, me and one of my best friends did go through a big fishing phase though for a while, and we would fish in this pond in our old neighborhood and catch the same fish every single day. I kid you not, the same fish, and we had them all <laughs> named. That's funny. <laughs> there was a there was a bass named Big In and a catfish named Catzilla. There was a whole family of Catzillas. Anyways, yeah, someone else can go. Nice, nice. <laughs> All right, uh, Isaiah, what about you? Um, so, well, for this book, I basically never heard of it until Cooper told us about it, and then I realized we had to read it for school. Um, and I just read it, like, this week. 
But yeah. for like fishing and the ocean, well, for fishing, uh, I've been fishing basically ever since I was probably like three. Um, yeah. what a man. Yeah, and you know, first time I went fishing, I caught more fish than my dad, which is kind of funny. <laughs> with a little At three Walmart years old. Pun. It was a Walmart fishing <laughs> rod, like one of those toy ones with the plastic fish on yeah. it. And my dad took that off and put a hook on it, and then. Yeah. <laughs> nice. What a legend. I know, right? Um. And then with the ocean, basically, I don't know, ever since I was little, we just went there, like, to go to beach, to go to the beach or on cruises or something like that. Yeah, Isaiah's going on more cruises than he's probably been to the beach, just going to be honest. No, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> no. This is a fact. <laughs> yeah, yes. Anyway. I mean, if you count going to the beach every time we're on a cruise, like, if we go to an island and then we go to That's the beach true. there. Fair whoa, enough. whoa, whoa, let's make this Fair a big enough. argument. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Let's not. Tanner, go. <laughs> <laughs> Taylor, you can go ahead and go. I feel like I need to do that. Uh, <laughs> Cooper. <laughs> um, so my baggage with the book The Old Man in the Sea. Um, I started reading this book for school um, uh, this summer, actually. And uh, then school actually started, so I had to ac- actually start reading school books before we got to the old man in the sea, and now we're finally the old man in the sea this week, and I still haven't finished it. So, <laughs> nice, Tanner. Um, but man, give well, me a break, guys. I'm working. Kidding. I'm working. <laughs> I'm I'm still I'm behind on other. <laughs> I'm still working on other school. Um, but I really enjoyed this book and can't wait to talk about it. Um, uh, so far at least. Right. Um, uh, and then. Uh, um, I don't have a very, actually, I guess it, you could call it complex, um, background on water and fishing in general. Um, Fair my enough. dad has, uh, um, his entire business revolves around, uh, surface water, um, like lakes and ponds and streams and rivers and all that greatness. Um, and so I've, I, I can't even remember the first time I went fishing, <laughs> If I'm going to be on harps and honest, um, uh, but basically I've always been around the water my entire life. I even live at the lake now, so I'm watching guys fish right outside my window right now <laughs> as I'm recording nice. this. That's awesome. And, uh, and I and I kid you not, I'm literally watching them fish. Um, <laughs> uh, but ocean, um, uh, we go to the ocean a lot. I actually just got back from Florida. Man, Tanner's the... a busy man. <laughs> Come on. So you can't judge me for not finishing the old man in the yeah. sea already oh, after yeah. starting yeah. it twice. <laughs> hey Tanner, though, why don't why don't you go ahead and tell us uh, the last like scene of where you left off, just so we have an idea. Um, last scene where I just left off, I believe uh, he had just started to um, eat the dolphin. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. That's good. All right. Well, my baggage. So, I think that I had known Ernest Hemingway's name a long time before I read the book. And if you had asked me, like, who, Her- who Ernest Hemingway is, I'd be like, oh, he's a writer. And so he has that name, doesn't he? Like, yep. If yep, you know, didn't know who he was, you'd be like, oh, yeah, he's a writer, for sure. Mm-hmm. I can believe that. But over the summer, we got a bunch of school books in. And so I just basically opened them up and took the most interesting covers, and I <laughs> read those covers and, and oh, read the book goodness. of each of those. And so I read Old Man of the Sea, and I just fell in love with her, Hemingway's writing style and the book itself. And I'm really excited to talk about it like Tanner is. But um, ocean and fishing, I've never been a big fisher guy. I don't have the patience for that, <laughs> just going to be honest. And I don't think it's just the patience. It's just the fact that it doesn't take too much skill. Uh, I'm, I'm sure it does take some skill, but not anything that can be quantified, at least in my opinion. But anyway. Also, the ocean, I've been going to the ocean, like, my entire life. We've been to the ocean, like, every year, except for, like, one year. And so, I've always loved the ocean, but I've never felt, like, drawn to it, like some people are, I guess you could say. But I really love the ocean, anyway. So, anyway. Well, we're already, like, nine minutes in. We haven't talked about the book. So, let's talk about the book, guys. What do you guys think about the book? I enjoyed his writing style, um, personally. I kind of like that we don't really get names for a while and that he kind of just refers to him as the old man yeah. and the boy and it it kind I kind of really love that just the fact that he kind of kept away the names so that you don't really have the super personal relationship with him but you can kind of uh, 
relate to him more because you haven't gotten like all of his physical features and all of that. You kind of just get to relate with his personality, I guess. Yeah, and even when he's talking to himself, he calls himself the old man. And they call yeah. himself like Santiago. Yeah, yeah or this old man. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, I actually really liked that as well. And uh, I can't tell you the name of the boy. Actually, I I'm, I know they I say it like a couple man times. Man and Lido or something. But like I can't that. remember. Yeah, I can remember Santiago. And I was gonna say something about that. Tanner, we we all wrote short stories last year. And Tanner, wasn't the name of your tree in your short story Santiago? Something was named Santiago. I'll look at it right now. Actually, or was it the bird? It might have been the bird. But yeah, I I kind of thought you had read this before and based it off of this, but maybe I was wrong. So yeah, that's yeah. actually my next question. Kind of, uh, Hemingway has a really unique writing style and voice. So what were you guys' experiences with that, and how was it different? How'd you like it? Um, you might need to repeat that question, but I the bird's name was Santiago. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, no, that's Cooper cool. asked, um, what do like what did we specifically like about the writing style, and what were our quote experiences with it? Yes, quote. Um, I, I I know what you mean, but I'm trying to th- think how to put this into words. Um, I like. It would be helpful to like compare him to someone else we've read. You know, let's let's take the two extremes. Let's take Hemingway and let's take Gary Paulson. Um, no, no, because he had Paulson. a yeah, he had a like, big some, somebody like some like more unique. Let's do Hawthorne. Samuel or no no, what's his some Hawth- Let's take Hawthorne. He wrote the Scarlet Letter, right? Right. Let's compare. Okay. Him and Hemingway, all right? I have something very quick on that one. So I th- I love both of these writers um, because of uh, both of their writings are m- almost all mental, yet they're focused on physical things, too. It's not really... Um, oh, name slipped me. Goober, i.e. Oh, Poe? Oh, yes. Um, Edgar, po- Edgar, Edgar Allan Poe. Edgar Allan Poe's writing, where it's like all mental, like all yes. in the mind. There all it is. Tanner said but, it. Tanner said what I couldn't say. But <laughs> I really loved it that um, uh, he like made it physical too, and uh, was mostly mental about it. Like it's all in this old man's mind, but it's still in the. You're still in the physical war- world as you're yeah. doing that. And well, I think going back to Matthew, sorry, real quick, you taught, you wanted to kind of compare him to Gary Paulson. I think he's a little bit similar, although I think Hemingway's obviously a better writer. But definitely. Gary Paulson and Hemingway have that kind of same thing where they focus, like Tanner said, they're more mental, but they're writing it in third person, but they get really up close and personal and somehow like tweak their writing style to where you feel like you're inside their mind, but it's not in first person, which is Yeah, really right. That's kind of what I was going at. But I, I also wanted to say about specifically Hemingway's, like, if you don't have a perfect picture of every scene painted in your mind, then I don't understand. You must be reading the wrong book because Hemingway just, like, writes everything in such, like, not too much detail and not too little detail, just, like, the perfect amount so that exactly you really, like, it's a, mm-hmm. it's a lifelike picture you know, seeing it playing in your mind while you're reading more than many other writers. Oh, yeah. And he, I mean, didn't make it any, like, boring or anything like that or, like, just too descriptive. It was, like, perfect where you could picture everything and nothing, like, you wouldn't miss stuff. But it wasn't, like, too boring where you'd miss everything or too descriptive or anything like that. I would compare him to almost E.B. White, you know, who wrote Charlotte's Web. And the fact that every single word is used for a purpose in here. There are no wasted words, and like you guys said, he chooses the perfect words to describe everything that's happening. And it's not like Hawthorne, where he uses a lot of big words and a lot of stuff to describe things. Yeah, he uses things. simple words. Exactly, and and honestly, I can see more from Hemingway's descriptions than I can from Hawthorne's. Oh, yeah, Hawthorne's I agree. Get lost I think Hemingway is probably one of the most, uh, you know... Clean. Yeah, clean of the writers that we've read. And... Um, like you were saying, like he, every word has a purpose, and it's used uh, so smartly in its place, or so cleverly. Because like I'm thinking of like Tolkien, how in right. Lord of the Rings he goes on and on to describe everything, and you know description's good, but I feel like he doesn't always uh, use the same amount of cleverness in like placing words, because sometimes he'll like use a word that maybe me- could mean something else, and then he has to go back and spend another sentence explaining, but not in this way, only in this way, and then describe it more, and it kind of yeah. just goes on and on and gets a little bit boring. 
But it does. with mm-hmm. with Hemingway, I think he just uses the right amount. Oh yeah. I agree. I mean, I'm willing to give you that Tolkien sometimes definitely yeah. does overdo it on the descriptions. Uh-huh. But and what's funny is, you know, uh, reading it this time, I'm noticing how much stuff I missed over the last couple of read throughs. Because this time I love it even more, and so I'm reading a little closer than I would have had I not, and just finding all of this like gold that he had written, and uh, I'm sure we'll talk about it. But I was like, I wish you had left this on the surface and hadn't gone too thick and too deep in your descriptions, uh-huh. because Cooper's then, talking about Lord of the Rings for the record. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm talking about Lord of the Rings, and I thought that it would be even better if you left these to the surface, you know. Right. But not everybody can write like Hemingway for sure. Uh-huh. Very unique. Mm-hmm. Yeah, speaking of Lord of the Rings, I'm rereading it right now. I'm on page 80, and they finally left on their journey. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> let's go. It's like yeah. it's like Harry Potter 5 when it's like page 200, and they finally go to Hogwarts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, what the heck? Yeah. And also kind of talking about that, <laughs> Hemingway really does that, except in the opposite way. Rick Rowling makes it interesting over 200 pages, and even care you haven't gone to Hogwarts, and you're 200 pages in. But anyway, like trims that down into where you're like five pages in and he's already on the boat or something like that but Mm -hmm. you know you feel already in the story the pacing feels good it's a 44 page book but man let me tell you these are some big pages wait 44 pages oh i think you have do you have what edition do you have i have like like, me oh i have it on my phone and on my phone it says it's 989 pages mine (laughs) mine is (laughs) I have 127 pages. I know. You flip one, you scroll one page, and it does like four. Mm. Interesting. It's weird. But anyway, okay. mine says 127, and it's uh. small pages. So you must have like a Dover Thrip edition. Whatever. Mine is a Benediction edition, oh, which is basically that. the same thing, yes. Oh, okay. Well, anyway. Uh-huh. All right, so anything else you guys want to say on a style before I move on? Uh, Yes, I do. So you guys were talking about Tolkien, and... Uh, all of like him going too deep. I think that he took. I think that um, Hemingway is just this perfect mix between um, Edgar Allan Poe and Tolkien. He just took all of that mental stuff and then put great description into it, but not too deep. So he kind of took the best parts of both worlds on yeah. Tolkien's writing style mm-hmm. and uh, Hemingway's writing style, and I really enjoyed that because uh, all of their because you're kind of in their mind and seeing everything through a third-person view while still being able to see his mind in a first-person view with amazing descriptions mm-hmm. that makes you feel like you're in his head, but you're not. Yeah, for sure. Well, yeah, great so, job, Hemingway. Four yes, out of four. Yes, thumbs exactly. up. Woo-hoo. Yes. So, um, I think Wait, that... four out of four? <laughs> yeah, there's four of us here. All right, look, oh, Cooper, yes, go to the next right. one. Oh, I see. oh okay, right, okay, right. okay. Anyway, so I think that I enjoy stories, either movies or books, that treat anything as an art, or at least you know, anything sensible as an art, even if we may not think of it as one. I think that if you asked me, like, what, what you, what's your favorite movie, or what movie type, I would have said movies that treat something like an art. Um, I wouldn't have said, like, sci-fi or fantasy or anything like that. And I think that this story does that with fishing. It takes this guy who's obviously a master at his craft, and it just puts him in the middle of a boat and, like, tests him to the extreme. And you just see his thoughts and see his fishing, you know, expertise at play while he's, you know, trying to get this massive fish. And just the, the, even the little things, like, he can sense when the, the fishing twine or the rope is about to break and he can, like, let go or something like that. He can feel the the fish on the, you know, the line, like, 2,000 or 200 fathoms below and just, you know, gently doing all that stuff i thought that was really awesome yeah and there's all those descriptions of like him and how he thinks about the ocean and there's like that whole paragraph about like it's a little bit weird but it's also a little bit like like art like you were saying and it's like he thinks of the ocean as a her as feminine and it like keeps going on like that there's like some people are say mean things about the ocean they call it a he they call him it they call it a brute they call it like all mean and call it right and but he was like but i think of it like this and it I was like, that's pretty, that's pretty powerful. It's pretty deep. There, yes. I, I said powerful again, sorry. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I will point out that that, just to clarify, Matthew, that's not uncommon when you're talking about the ocean and sailors, like, no. just oh, in yeah, general. Oh, yeah, I know, I'm just, yeah, I just liked how the, how Hemingway put it in there. Oh, yeah, definitely. 
I agree yeah. with that. And I kind of relate to Billy Bud, a book we read been doing the podcast, but we read it for school. Uh-huh. And it's, I mean, it's Herman Melville, so it's really thick. But if they talk about a love for the ocean, I didn't catch it really. No, <laughs> you know, and Melville is obviously the extreme to where, you know, he's really dense and stuff like that. But Hemingway is just the description of the old man and his like love for the sea and his love for fishing and everything like that. Uh, it's just so beautiful. Yeah, for sure. So let's talk about the purpose of the book. I, th- I think that pretty much every story has a purpose, and Hemingway decided to tell this story. So why do you think this story is important? What do you, important, and what do you think the purpose should, of it should is? Should we tell the story first? Oh, yeah. Book in 30 uh, seconds? Book in 30 seconds. Cue the theme music. All right. Um, <laughs> Painter, why don't you try this one? You redeem yourself after... What, which book would you try to do? To kill a mockingbird? <laughs> anyway, yeah, redeem yourself. I haven't yourself. finished Go the ahead, book. He hasn't read the whole thing, Cooper. Oh, my gosh. I'll do right. it. I'll do it. Sorry, <laughs> what an insult. Go ahead. <laughs> I'll do it. All right. Ready? Three, two, one. So it starts off, you meet an old man and a boy and their fishing partners, but then the boy gets taken away from being his partner by his parents and has to go partner up with other fishermen. And the boy and the old man have a really cool relationship, and they always do stuff together. But the old man has gone 84 days without catching a fish, and this is his almost his longest record his actual record is 87 days and so on the 85th day when he's 85 years old and there's a bunch of 85s and it's like the 85th day of the year (laughs) and all this junk then he goes out and he goes out deep into the ocean catches this really huge fish that pulls him along for like three days and then a bunch of sharks come and try to eat the fish and he's like stabbing them with a spear that he made out of a knife in his or thingy and then uh the the sharks eat all of the fish and it's just like a big skeleton and then he goes back to the shore and everybody sees it and then uh him and the boy go back as fishing partners at the end oh the book yeah. in a minute wow nice sorry was that a minute yeah it was a minute. It's been yeah and yeah well he missed like one of the best parts him arm wrestling a dude for a day straight oh yeah it's true <laughs> like, what the heck that was a that was a flashback it wasn't really sorry yeah, part but, but like, I was, like I was no, to... what the heck <laughs> as he was like I don't care about anything else you said the most important part of the book was the arm wrestling anyway. yeah, it kind of was man so, so Isaiah thinks the purpose of the book is arm wrestling but what do you guys think Isaiah, Isaiah. no okay ha, Isaiah ha. I always ask to arm wrestle you and you're like no no I, I don't like arm wrestling I don't want to oh I don't want to I'm just saying it's cool that the guy did it for that <laughs> yeah, <it's true. laughs> Isaiah uh, looks upon him and wants to be like him yes <laughs> He, he like puts down his phone like squeezes his muscles and he's like oh, I could do that <laughs> <laughs> oh man looks at his arms he's like hmm, someday Isaiah some... <laughs> <laughs> sorry Isaiah no, we're, we're, All right. no. <laughs> okay it's back on topic back yeah, on topic yeah, yeah. purpose of the book purpose of the book I think it would be to show this um, uh, old man's perseverance and uh, um, his strength of heart and mind. He was just so um, headstrong and stubborn. He would <laughs> he wouldn't let go of the fish after two days. Yes, yeah, right. And he's still going. His uh, his arms are getting cramped, and his he's having to find food everywhere, and he's still not dropping this stupid rope that's hooked onto this fish. I just think it's mm-hmm. um uh, this super um. Like it just it's just showing the this perseverance, and if we want to link this to the gospel and Jesus, I think that's yeah. the kind of perseverance we should have um, when we hit persecution and uh, um, uh, trials, and uh, like when we have we have to hold on to Jesus like that, even when we're getting towed everywhere, all the way out to the ocean. We just got to hold on. Dang. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I agree with you, Tanner. I think it really is just. The fact that this man has to, it's his calling, he has to go out and he has to fish, you know. Uh-huh. Um, and he just has to keep getting up, you know. All the movies, it's, you know, I think like, you know, Endgame where Captain America's like down and the music swells and he like rises up out of the ground. I think this book is like that, but with an old man in the sea. <laughs> right. You know, just this old man fighting, you know, for this fish and fighting for I guess his life, and essentially, and it's also uh, like t- well, I agree with what Tanner was saying. Like when times are going fast and going hard, you got to hold on tight to the truth and um, hold on to God and stuff like that. But also, it shows kind of more at the beginning when times are slow. You have to uh, not not give up. You have to just right. keep going, um, even when uh, it's kind of dragging you down, or you like you really want to be out there in the ocean struggling with a fish. 
but you know you just like i mean he uses the word luck in this book and he always says he doesn't have the luck but um like yeah like that in real life as well yes for sure yeah and i think that this i mean honestly the first time i read this and even when i think about it now um just wow just what a great story just i mean honestly mm-hmm. it's one of the i mean i don't know i'm gonna say it guys one of the best stories i've ever read just gonna be honest you know and it's just mm-hmm. about this old man and his relationship with the sea and with fishing mm-hmm. and just the fact that every day you need to get up you need to have courage you need to you know wrestle in the big marlin even when you know the sharks or in, in this case i'm sure it's an allegory for the world come and attack you uh, yeah it's like tanner was saying with the gospel like we have to stand strong we have to fight them off with whatever we have and we have to have courage and trust in the lord see that's the beauty of how it was written it's so simple that you can just easily see all the lessons that can be learned from this or all the uh things to take out of it um but yeah but it's I think... not like hitting you in the face yeah, like exactly. you're also like with raya and the last dragon so like the whole world <laughs> is like shaped like a river and a dragon what and so there are five different okay, tribes and they're all named after like a part of the dragon and so the good guys are from heart right <laughs> from the heart of the dragon guess where the bad guys are from Fang, but you know oh. it's like you know, <laughs> they're from Fang, and it's like okay good guy bad guy they gave you four but Hemingway is like I'm gonna give you these obvious messages but in a way that does not feel condescending in a way that's you can ha- you have to bring something to the table right but I'm not gonna make it overly hard for you and you can also kind of compare it to C.S. Lewis like in his whole Narnia story in the th- in the world he created there Except, obviously, this is way smaller. It's a smaller book, and it's not, right, right. like, however many books Narnia is, but... Seven. Yeah, but, I mean, just kind of like the, the allegory and, um, like, how clearly it represents real life, um, even though it's a story, but you can still tell what every piece of the story means. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, in this book, it's so great, even just the little things, like, talking about Joe DiMaggio or, you know, something like that. Just the little things with that, you know, his, his I guess his dad was his dad was a fisherman or something like that. It's how I can relate to him. And then I don't I know Tanner hasn't gotten there yet, but the end scene with the family who's on vacation, they're in the restaurant. They're like, "Well, what's that? What are those fish bones down there?" Or something like mm-hmm. that. And then the waiter's like, "Oh, it's a, it's a shark." He tries to explain it to them, and they're just kind of, "Oh, I don't know. Sharks could get that big." And it's just the <laughs> fact that they're so oblivious to this massive thing that just happened. And they're just like, eh, I wonder what the deal with those fish bones is. Mm-hmm. So, all right. Anything else we want to say about The Old Man and the Sea? Would you recommend this book? Oh, yeah, definitely. Oh, definitely. And it's not even like, here, I'm going to ask you to go spend 10 hours of your life by uh, going and reading Lord of the Rings right. Part 1 for me, okay? And then tell me if you like <laughs> it or not, which you probably won't. It's like, go read this book. It's going to take <laughs> you an hour, and you're going to love it. Take insult to that, but yes, I agree with everything. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, uh, Tanner Isaiah. Oh, I definitely. I mean, yeah, it's a good book. Yes, and for like sure. Matthew's saying, it's not long or anything like that, so like, like you won't waste any time reading it. Yeah, for sure. And even if it did take a long time, it wouldn't be a waste. It's a, it's definitely worth reading. It is. I think it's mm-hmm. I think it's a great book. I think it is. Anyway, let's do yeah. some. Uh... No, sorry, Tanner. Do you have something to say? Yeah, I, I would just say, I was recommending this book to someone actually today, and uh, um, here's, what I was, here's what I definitely tell, told them. Don't come into this book expecting to have this whole elaborate storyline and right. uh, have this super big um, plot twist and all this greatness right here. Come into this book with a very low expectation for a very low, um, like, kids book i guess if you would come into it and when you get in there and you actually read the entire thing you're going to come out with expectations that were just as big as the um ones that you um would come into for lord of the rings and such but you have to come in with low expectations that way when you come in you've got this great book because that's what i came into it so you're saying (laughs) if you come in with low expectations it'll be a better book huh yeah, well, actually, for... I came in with high expectations because Cooper has been talking it up for a long time, and I, mm-hmm. I like I said at the beginning, it, it definitely met the expectations, but I think it met it in a different way. I kind of did expect it to be like an actual, I don't know, like a plot or story or something, yeah. but it, I didn't really realize it was going to be uh, kind of like this, how we were talking about. Yeah, and talking like that, it's it's not this big, massive, you know, expansive plot, 
but it's a great story. You know, it may not be in a, a, a type of story that's got a lot of plot, but it's a great story. So anyway. Yeah, don't try All and... Right. Con- I guess my thing would be, don't try and confine it to your box of an, an idea right. of what you think a story right. should be. Come into it like what the writer was thinking, and you're going to have your entire thought of a good book blown away. For sure, for sure. All right. Um, let's see here. Okay, I'm going to say the donor, and you say what type of fish you think they most resemble <laughs> That's or pretty would good. be like. Okay, maybe not resemble, but would be like. <laughs> okay. Um, Tanner, Nana. Marlin. <laughs> Iridescence, I love it. Okay. Um, Isaiah, <laughs> oh, sorry, Matthew, Van Papi and Wayla. Clownfish. Nice. Oh, and I was going to use that. Isaiah, your grandparents. My grandparents, I'll give them salmon. <laughs> nice salmon. All right, Tanner, this is a good one. I like this. Mr. Mike and Miss Laura Ritsky. Trout. Let's. They just sound because his name's Mike, so like Mike Trout. I, I don't asked know. Tanner. It's, no, it just has to be Trout. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'll, okay, Tanner, you can take this one. Uh, Isaiah's uncle Sebi. Oh, uh, let's go tuna. Some big, nice, nice. juicy tuna. Tuna, bro. All right. <laughs> what? Um, Isaiah, your aunt, uncle Sam, and Jenny. Or Sharks. aunt Jenny and uncle Sam. I think like Stop that. saying that. <laughs> 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 right. Right. Sharks, huh? Uh, okay, nice. Um, Matthew, Isaiah's cousins, Moses and Zara. Moses and Zara, catfish. Nice. And then finally, last but not least, Tanner, Chris. Hagedon. Um, so I'm going to take some inspiration from these guys. I'm looking out over here, and they're catching some striper right now. So we're nice. going to do some of that right now. Striper. Striper bass. Stripe on, man. All right. Thank you guys so much for donating. If you want to donate, where do they go, Isaiah? To patreon.com forward slash booking it and donate to, or if you want a shout out, you got to donate to any of our tiers, $5 or above. That's right. Yeehaw! And if you can't do that for whatever reason, please make sure to rate and review us and tell your friends. So. Yes. With that all done, until next time, keep on booking it.